All right, today's topic is countability and diagonalization. Now, uh, I understand that if you took 151, actually, you've probably seen most of this lecture before, but that's okay. First of all, not everybody took 151. And, um, you know, it's okay to see, see things more than once, especially if they're, you know, great theoretical ideas in, like, proto-computer science. And, and, you know, we've had, like, you know, just a bunch of lectures on, like, group theory and linear algebra and, like, random walks and quantum. So it's, like, okay to, like, relax a little bit for, in some sense, for a lecture. Anyway, all of which is to say I'll be, you know, less offended than usual if you spend a lot lecture on your laptop. Okay, so, um, I will start with a quiz question. Oh, this is impossible to see. I don't know if it can be seen. Okay, never mind. I'll skip. I was going to ask you to identify who this is, but you cannot see it. Actually, maybe you can tell based on what it says here. This is a statue. Does anybody know who it is? I'll give you a hint. It's also this person. Do you know who that is? Who said, who said it? Yes, it's Galileo. Thank you. This is Galileo. He lived in uh, the 16th and 17th centuries in Italy. Uh, can somebody tell me the name of Galileo's most famous work? I thought you guys were scientists. Come on, this is a famous, a famous work. Yes? Uh, no, I don't think so. Although I did sort of concern astronomy. Do you know what it was about, his most famous work? Two or three, yeah, yeah. Well, no, Copernicus was the guy that said the Earth is around, revolved around the sun, but he was supporting that position. Yeah? I don't know. It's like the name of his most famous work. Yes? No? Oh, I thought you guys learned like history of science or something. It's a famous scientist. Okay, it's called a uh, dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, and as was stated, it's a dialogue. And it's about, you know, the, the difference between the Copernican view of the world where, uh, you know, the, I guess the planets go around the sun and the version where the, the, everything goes around the earth, which is the Ptolemaic system. And, you know, I guess it was the olden days and the religious authorities, right, so he couldn't just come out and say, like, the Copernican one is right, so he had, like, a dialogue between two characters, like, or three characters, in fact, like, discussing the issues. Um, so there are actually three characters in his dialogue. Uh, one is called Salviati. And uh, he was the one arguing in favor of, like, the, you know, the Earth going around the sun. And he was like, obviously, all these dialogues, you know, from Plato on, they have, like, a smart guy and, like, a dumb guy. And, like, so he was the smart one. He's the obvious stand-in for Galileo. So I'll use this picture of Galileo to denote him. Uh, he's named after a friend. And there's, like, Sagredo. He's, like, the neutral guy. He's just, like, an intelligent lay person. So he just, like, makes neutral comments. And he's also named after Galileo's friend one of his friends, uh, so I'll mostly leave him out. And then there's a guy, Simplicio, uh, who's like the idiot who argues for the Ptolemaic system that everything goes around the Earth, and he was named after uh, two of Galileo's enemies, one of whom was some guy called Cremonini, so here's a picture of Cremonini, who will represent Simplicio for us. <coughs> All right, uh, so that's him, as I said, 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, the last work he wrote, which is like his magnum opus, was also in dialogue format, and it was called, uh, it's usually just called Two New Sciences, some kind of summary of everything that he worked on. And I will now give you like a direct quote from this work, okay? I'm, oh, it was in either Italian or Latin, I don't know, but the English version. So this is straight like copying from the work. Uh, okay, so it's Salviati and Simplicio are talking. Okay, and Salviati says this. I'll, I'll read it. He says, I take it for granted that you know which of the numbers are squares and which are not. And Simplicio is like, yeah. He says, I'm quite aware that a squared number is one that results from multiplication of another number by itself, 4, 9, etc., are squares, which you get by squaring 2, 3, etc. This is all straight from the book. Okay, so then Salviati says, very well. Then I cut out like a paragraph where he defines the term square root and the term non-square. Uh, and then he says, okay, if I assert that all numbers, like all the natural numbers, including both squares and non-squares, are more than the squares alone, I shall speak the truth, shall I not? And Simplicio is like, yeah, most certainly. Okay, then Salviati goes on and says, okay, if I should ask further how many squares there are, 
one might reply truly that there are as many as the corresponding number of square roots, since every square has its own square root, and every square root has its own square. And Simplicio says, yeah, precisely so. And then Salviati says, but if I inquire how many square roots there are, it can't be denied that there are as many as numbers, because every number is the square root of some square. <coughs> so every number is a square root. So he goes on, this being granted, we must say that there are as many squares as there are numbers, because they're just as numerous as their square roots, and the number of, and all the numbers are square roots. Yet, at the outside, we said that there are many more numbers than squares. So, problem? <laughs> okay, so this is a pretty uh, astute observation by Galileo back in, like a million years ago. Uh, so then Segredo, the neutral guy, says, okay, what should we conclude under these circumstances? <coughs> so Salviati goes on, and he says, neither is the number of squares less than the totality of all numbers. And I'm going to introduce a, a fourth character who was not in the original dialogue, called Cantor. He lived in um, <laughs> well, the 19th and 20th centuries. And if he were to respond, he would at this point say, good, good, right? <laughs> Nor, Salviati goes on, are the latter greater than the former. Good. And then, Salviati's last sentence is this. He says, and finally, we deduce that the attributes equal, greater, and less are not applicable to infinite, but only finite quantities. And, and Cantor would be like, oh, so close. Like, he should have just kept going and saying, like, yep, that's right. Like, there's the same number of squares as numbers. Like, deal with it. But instead, he made this, like, you know, disappointing conclusion that, like, well, you just, if the sets are infinite, this notions of like equal and less than are broken. Um, but it would have been so awesome if he had like made the correct conclusion like 300 years or whatever before Cantor. He came pretty close. Okay, so uh, let's review Salviati's arguments in mathematical form rather than prose form. Um, okay, so he's like, on one hand he talked about the set of all numbers, which let's say the naturals, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Oops, and he talked about the squares, which is just 0, 1, 4, 9, et cetera. Those are two sets. And the very first thing he said to Simplicio was like, okay, all numbers, and includes all the squares, and also some numbers that are not squares, <coughs> which we might write mathematically as just saying, yes, the set of all squares S is a subset of all numbers, but it's like not equal. There are some numbers that are not squares. And that was, you know, him trying to suggest that like there are fewer squares than there are just numbers. Okay, and then the next thing he said was that every square, like 9, has its own square root, and every square root has its own square. Which is like um, this, right? He's saying like for every number it has a square, and for every square it has a square root. Okay, or in mathematical terms, what would you say this uh, is saying? From like lecture 3 or something, or 5 or something? Yes, there's a bijection between this set, and in this set, S. There's a one-to-one uh, -one and onto mapping. Okay, that's what he was saying down here. Now let's uh, go on. So, Cantor, you know, eventually in the 19th century, made the following definition. Let us say that two sets, A and B, have the same cardinality. Cardinality is, I guess, another word for size. And we'll write, you know, bar A equals bar of B if there exists a bijection between them, okay, if there exists a bijection between them. That's his definition, which we're going to run with for the rest of the lecture. I want to add one crucial point here. This is not a definition of what bar of A means. I'm not defining the size of a set. All I'm defining here is what it means for two sets to have the same size. Okay, so I'm defining this phrase, A and B have the same cardinality. I'm not defining what the cardinality of A is. Okay, so two sets will say they have the same size if there's a bijection between them. It just kind of makes sense. Now, uh, well, let me first remind you what a bijection is. I hope you remember, but uh, there's different ways you can look at it. If you think about it in terms of graphs, uh, it's a perfect matching between A and B. Uh, or you can think of it as a mapping F, a function from A to B, which has two properties. Inject, you know, it's injective and surjective. Injective means that, like, uh, if you have 
two different elements that cannot map to the same element. And surjective means that every element in the range B is mapped onto by somebody. Okay? <clears throat> so everybody goes somewhere and uh, you know, nobody gets two people coming into it. No, I guess, yeah, anyway. Uh, and a third definition, these are all equivalent, is to say that it's a function which has an inverse function. <laughs> that uh, you, know, you can reverse going from A to B by doing the inverse step. And this inverse is also a bijection. Okay, I hope you remember this. Okay, now uh, this was the definition we're going with. A and B have the same cardinality if uh, there's a bijection between them. And so, for example, you know, from what we saw, what Galileo showed, the cardinality of the natural numbers is the same as the cardinality of the set of squares, because here's a bijection, f mapping the natural numbers into the squares defined by f of a is a squared. Okay, so why is this a bijection? Well, it's pretty clear it's a surjection, right? Because to be a surjection, you have to hit every square. Well, you know, if you want to hit like nine, you just plug in three. And it's also an injection because, uh, well, no two natural numbers have the same square. So of course, by the way, if I made the domain of f the integers, then it would no longer be an injection. Why? Yes, x and negative x have the same square. Um, but luckily, x and negative x aren't both in the naturals unless x is 0, but then x is negative x. So, OK. Uh, now, you might object slightly here, because this, in some sense, overloads some mathematical notation we're used to, right? So normally, if you have a finite set, you put bars around it. That means the number of elements in it. So like, we should make sure that we're not like, accidentally redefining the notion of the size of a finite set here. <coughs> but actually, that's not too hard. So. Uh, Here's just like three sets. I'll just give you an illustration. A is the set red, green, and blue, and B is the set of these three real numbers, and C is the numbers one, two, three, four. And uh, you know, we normally say the cardinality of A is three, and the cardinality of B is three, and the cardinality of C is four. Right? So luckily, it's, we're safe here, right? There, A and B have the same cardinality, three, and there is a bijection between them. There's several. You can map, I don't know, red to 0 0.03, and green to minus two, and blue to 18, and that's an injective and surjective map. And there's no in bijection between B and C. Like, you can never have, for example, a surjective map even from B to C. Because you only have three things to start from, you cannot cover four things. OK, so this notation is consistent with our notation for finite sets. It's true, like, if you have two finite sets, they're the same size if you can, like, put them in one-to-one -one correspondence, right? OK, and so we're extending it to infinite sets now. Uh, it's also true, you can see that if, like, let's take C, the set 1, 2, 3, 4, it's pretty easy to see that there's no bijection between it and the natural numbers, right? Because uh, you could never, let's say, have a, a surjective map even from 1, 2, 3, 4 into the naturals. You just can't cover them with four uh, items. So we deduce that C and the naturals have different cardinalities. Okay, so now one objection that you might think of if you haven't seen this before is like maybe we haven't really done anything interesting here. Like maybe this is just helping us capture the difference between finite sets and infinite sets. Okay, so you know, to address that you might think to yourself, okay, let's say A and B are two infinite sets. Is it true that they have equal cardinality? <coughs> and if that were true, then it would just basically mean this cardinality notion would just let you tell what sets are infinite and otherwise if they're finite how big they are. Okay, <clears throat> so this is exactly what motivated Cantor in 1873 when he was thinking about this stuff. So let's do some examples to try and get a, a, a flavor for it. Okay, let's say we have the set E, the set of all even naturals. I will ask you a question. Does this set have the same cardinality as the cardinality of the naturals? Okay, can somebody tell me a bijection from the evens to the naturals? 
uh, a bijection between the evens, from the evens to the naturals. Yes? Yes, very good. Uh, oh, well, I have this like straw man of Simplicio saying, like, it seems unlikely, but because, you know, you, if you've never seen this before, you might think to yourself, okay, E is a proper subset of N, and the first natural bijection you might try is just like map X to X, which is not onto. But, you know, the thing to remember in this definition is they have the same cardinality if there exists a bijection between them. Okay, so you have to potentially try all bijections, and as was suggested, there's one that works. The function that takes x and outputs x over 2. Okay, that's pretty easy to see that it's a bijection. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. One-to-one -one and onto. Okay, great. So here's a case where it was sort of true. We have these two infinite sets, and yep, they have the same cardinality. Any questions about that? Okay, let's do another one. Uh, let's look at all the positive naturals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Uh, do these two sets have the same cardinality? Yes. Can somebody tell me a bijection from n to n plus? Yes? Yes, very good. The bijection is uh, f of a equals a plus 1. That's a bijection from n to n plus the positive integers. Does everybody see that? Good. Uh, okay, so does the cardinality of the evens equal the cardinality of the positive integers? You would hope so, right? Because uh, the last two things we showed was like this equation and this equation. So if we don't also have that the cardinality of E is the same as the cardinality of the positive integers, then we have selected extremely bad notation. Because uh, remember, I'm not defining size of sets, just if two sets have the same size. But uh, luckily, it's fine. <coughs> there is a bijection from E to the natural numbers, uh, the positive naturals. Can somebody tell me one? Yeah? Yeah. The bijection uh, from evens to positive naturals is divide by 2 and add 1. And in fact, that idea, I mean, you probably just didn't think about that out of nowhere. You can get it by composing these two bijections that we just talked about. <coughs> right, so let's talk about transitivity. Here's a theorem, which is pretty easy. Let's say there's a bijection from A to B and a bijection from B to C. Then there is a bijection from A to C. It's a pretty easy theorem, and that tells us that if A and B have the same size and B and C have the same size, then indeed A and C have the same size. So it's you know, reassuring. Okay, so if I call this one F and I call this one G, can somebody tell me the bijection from A to C? Um, close. Yes, G of F of X. So it's a uh, Function G composed with F. So to get from A to C, first do F and then do G. Okay, why is this a bijection? Okay, I'll tell you why it's an injection. How do we check that it's an injection? You want to show that if you start with two different things, you end up with two different things. So suppose you start with two different things. You plug it into F. F is a bijection. Therefore, it's an injection. That means once you plug in these two guys into F, you get two different things. And then you plug them into G. G is also an injection, so you again get two different things. So that proves the composition is an injection. Can somebody tell me why it's a surjection? Yeah, aren't you? Um, yeah, I would prefer to say it in a slightly more clear way. Um, how do you show something is a surjection? You need to show that for everything in C, there's something you can plug into G compose F that gets to that guy. 
Okay, but for everything in C, since G is the subjection, we know there's something in B that goes to that. And then since F is the subjection, we know there's something that goes to the, okay, that was a bad thing to explain in words, but maybe uh, I, I cannot fault Anshu for his explanation either. But okay, it's not too hard to prove. Good. Okay, let's do some more examples. Let's ask whether the cardinality of the naturals equals the cardinality of the integers. Uh, you know, again, n is a subset of z, so you might think maybe not. And if you list it like this, it doesn't look so clear. But you see, if you just list the elements of z in a different order, like this, first 0, then minus 1 plus 1, minus 2 plus 2, minus 3 plus 3, it's just a different ordering, and now it looks pretty good for the idea that they're in one-to-one -one correspondence. So can somebody tell me a bijection from n to z? Yeah? Yeah, kind of like just going down in this map, right? So you could give a formula here. Somebody want to give a formula? Not that it's that important, but yeah. Yeah, very good. That's right. If you didn't catch it, he said uh, it's, this is a formula that is like a bijection from n to z. So you take the number. Do minus 1 to that number, that'll give you like this alternating even odd pattern, and then you need to do like ceiling of the number over 2. Great. So the answer to this one is yes. OK, here's another one. Let P be the set of all prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, etc. Let's ask whether the positive naturals have the same cardinality as P. We need to find a bijection from uh, n plus to so here's n plus, here's p. It's looking pretty good. And yet, if I was like, okay, give me the formula, it's not completely obvious, right, how you would give like the bijection from n plus to p. Uh, can somebody suggest the bijection from n plus to p? Yeah? Yeah, the proposal is, uh, I'll give it to, you know, Cremonini. The bijection is f of n is the nth prime number. So is that okay? Yes? No? Do you have a problem with that? It's a little weird, right? It's not like the other ones where you're like, check out this bijection. Yeah? Well, you said that if you can prove there's an infinite number of prime numbers, then they have an order to them. That would work. There's an infinite number of real numbers. Do they have an order to them? Kind of. There's an infinite number of complex numbers. Do they have an order to them? Not really. Yeah. Well, so, you know, do you think that's okay? This function f of n is the nth prime number. Is that, like, okay? So it looks a little suspicious, I mean, if you haven't seen it before, right? But, you know, you could respond. It's a well-defined function, right? And it's a bijection, right? So, yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, that's, it's fine. Okay, so, yeah, this bijection, <laughs> f of n is the nth prime number. It's true. What he says is true. It's a, it's a function. It's a bijection. The end. Uh, any questions about that? Yeah? Uh huh. <coughs> well, the question is if that's the case, why cannot you take a ordering of the Cartesian product, you know, like maybe n cross n, n squared, and match that up with n? That's a good question. Wait for two slides from now. Uh, excellent question. Another question about this? Okay, I guess you're all okay with that. Great. 
OK, so that's the naturals. Uh, here are some other sets that we showed have the same cardinality as the naturals, the evens, the integers, the primes. And if you look at it now, if you write it like this, right, you kind of get a flavor of a different way to kind of look at the question. <coughs> this is a fact. If S is some infinite set, and you can list off its elements in some order, like the zeroth, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, etc., in like some unique, so in some well-defined way such that each number appears once, it, then by definition, you found like a bijection from the natural numbers to your set, you know? You know, the bijection takes, you know, four to the fourth number in your list. Okay, and that means that you've shown the cardinality of S is the same as the cardinality of the naturals. Okay, so this is another way to, like, ask yourself, is S uh, have the same cardinality as the naturals? It's like asking, is it possible to, like, list the elements of S, like just the first, the second, the third, okay, the zero at the first, second, third, et cetera. So here's the definition. Uh, any set S who's got the same cardinality as the naturals is called countably infinite. And there's a broader definition. A set is called countable if it's either finite or countably infinite. So somehow, like, at most, countably infinite. OK, let us continue the dialogue between these two gentlemen. OK, so let me get to exactly your question. Uh, one set that we decided was countable is z, the integers. So what about z squared, the set of all ordered pairs of integers? Uh, are they have the same cardinality? Do they have the same cardinality? Well, so far, everything we've seen had the same cardinality, right? So we have a streak going. Let's not break it. Uh, here's a picture of the ordered pairs of integers. It's like the lattice points, the integer grid. And I want to show that actually this set is countable. So if I sort of use the principle from this slide, I just have to list the integer grid points in some like definitive order that you know, has a zeroth, a first, a second, a third, and covers all of them exactly once. Which you can do in a variety of ways. There's like some pleasant geometric tricks you can do. Can somebody like think of a nice way to list them in a definitive order? Let's say starting at the origin. Uh, how about you? Yeah, very good. That's right. Well, that's one way to do it. So you can start here at, hey, Stephen, at the origin and, uh, and make a spiral, OK? So I'm not like literally formally defining what I'm doing here, but I think you get the point, right? You see that this is like a well-defined way to like list off all the pairs exactly once. And uh, you know, it goes in a normal order. I mean, it goes in an order. OK, so this, is, this gives you a well-defined bijection from the naturals to uh, z squared. Any question about that? OK. Let's take it to the next level. What about the set of all rational numbers? May I ask this is another infinite set. And it somehow feels like much bigger even than the integers, right? Uh, do you have a question or an answer? OK, then wait for it. Uh, now, if you think about this idea of, like, let's list the rationals in a sequence, it seems very hard, right? How are you going to, like, list them in a sequence? Like, you could be like, all right, 0, and then maybe, like, a half. But then, like, you missed all the rationals between 0 and a half, right? It doesn't seem like there's any natural way to, like, order them. Uh, everybody is like burning to like give me the answer. Um, maybe I should just go faster. Uh, um, okay, I'll give you the I'll give you the deduction. Uh, perhaps you all know it. Okay, it turns out this you know the set of all rationals is countable. You cannot you can indeed make a list that lists off all the rational numbers in like a definitive order: the zeroth, the first, the second, etc. So here's how you can do it. We just showed that z squared is countable. You can list out all the ordered pairs of integers. So let's do that. Here's the list. It started at 0, 0 with the spiral. 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, et cetera. Now, how do I get the rationals? I get them by this little algorithm. Go through this above list in order, 
and say you're at some pair p comma q, output p over q. Unless one of two things is true. Unless q is 0, then don't try to output p over q. Or if you've actually output this rational already, then don't output it again. OK, so if either of those happens, just go to the next pair of integers in the list. OK, so you'll go 0 over 0, skip it. 1 over 0, skip it. 1 over 1, that's OK, so I output 1. And 0 over 1, that's fine, so I output 0. Then minus 1 over 1, that's fine, I'll output minus 1. The next few you skip. Here I output minus 2, here I output 2, here I output a half. OK, and this indeed lists all the rationals exactly once. Um, you know, because if you have a rational number like, you know, 34 over 21, let's say, uh, then you'll eventually get to it. If it's, that's in lowest terms, which I think it is, you'll eventually get it to it when you see the pair 34 comma 21. And sort of by definition, you never list anything twice, so this gives you a, you know, implicitly a bijection from the naturals to the rationals. Okay, this one's a bit tricky. I mean, are there any questions about it? You feel kind of comfortable that this is like a legitimate bijection? Yeah? How is this injective? Yeah, so the question is how is it injective? Or let's look a little bit more carefully at what I mean. So what I'm saying here is I'm implicitly defining a function f from the naturals to the rationals. That's going to be injective and surjective. And the definition is going to be f of n is the nth number in this list, the list sort of output by this algorithm. So f of 0 is 1, f of 1 is 0, f of 2 is minus 1, f of 3 is minus 2, f of 4 is 2, f of 5 is a half, etc. Okay? So <clears throat> this is a function where it's a little bit hard to say what like f of 12 is. You know, you kind of have to like make this list and like cross off a bunch of stuff and eventually see like which was the 12th. The fact that it's injective is almost automatic because you sort of define it such that, well, I'm only going to map, you know, uh, I'm only going to output numbers that I haven't seen before. So I'll never like have two uh, numbers that uh, in the list that are the same. Any more questions? Okay. Let me say a few more things about injections and surjections. Let's take a break from doing examples. We'll come back to the next natural example soon. This is actually a definition. I'm going to define the phrase cardinality of A is at most the cardinality of B in symbols this. Again, I'm not going to define what cardinality means. I'm just going to define what it means to say that B is at least as big as A. Okay, I'm just going to say that B is at least as big as A if there's, there, there's an injection from A to B, which I hope is what you would expect, right? I mean, it sort of says that if you're going, you know, there's no more than elements in A than there are in B. Like, it's possible to have all the elements in A go to unique items in B. And maybe there's some in B left over if B is sort of way bigger than A, but that's okay. Okay, so A is cardinality at most out of B if there's an injection from A to B. For example, f of A equals A is an injection from the squares to the natural numbers. It's not a bijection because not all numbers are squares, but it is an injection. So we would, you can at least deduce from this or say from this that the cardinality of the squares is at most out of the naturals. Now, actually, we know they're equal, but that's okay. Or another injection uh, from q to z squared is to, you know, take the rational number q, write it in lowest terms, say p over q, and output p and q. Okay, that's an injection because uh, you don't have two different rational numbers that uh, are the same when you take them to lowest terms. Okay, now, again, you, if having made this definition, you might start to... Uh, worry a little bit about the notation. You see, say you have an injection from A to B, so you're like, great, I'm going to say cardinality of A is at most that of B. Say you have an injection from B to A, so you're going to say, great, I'm going to say the cardinality of B is at most the cardinality of A. Once you write down these two statements, again, if, you, if your notation is not going to be a major problem, you should 
be able to deduce that A and B have the same cardinality. Okay, otherwise, you've chosen horrible notation. So that raises the question, which is actually not obvious. Suppose you have two sets A and B. There's an injection from A to B, and there's an injection from B to A. Does there have to be a bijection between A and B? You know, it's possible to map everything in A to B such that there's no overlaps, but maybe there's stuff left over, and vice versa. Does that mean there actually has to be a perfect matching between them? Uh, could somebody tell me what one is? The answer is yes, because the notation is well chosen. But can you tell me how to get a bijection? Okay, I'm glad nobody gave me an answer, because it's actually not that easy. But it's true. It's a theorem called Cantor-Bernstein-Schroeder theorem, uh, that if there's an injection from A to B and one from B to A, then there exists a bijection from A to B. And I could prove it to you. It's not that hard, but it would take like five slides. So let's skip it. Okay? You can, I mean, you can, I don't know, please believe me that it's true. And, you know, if you're dying to see it, maybe I'll put it on Piazza or something. Okay, so that's to reassure you that the notation makes sense. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, one more definitional thing. This one's a bit easier. <clears throat> Let's just make the other natural definition. If there's a surjection from A to B, that means there's a map from A to B such that everything in B gets covered, we'll say cardinality of A is at least that of B. Don't denote it like this. Uh, so actually, once you have this, it, this is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, gives you easier ways to show that things are countable, to show that, to say that something is countable is to say that the cardinality of the naturals is at least the cardinality of the, the set in question. So let's say we want to show that the rationals are countable, that they have no more cardinality than the naturals. Well, we know that z squared is also countable. It has the same cardinality as the naturals. So to show that Q has at most that cardinality, it's enough to find a surjection from Z squared to Q. Okay? Now, but now your life is a bit easier because you have to find a map from pairs of integers to rationals, but you don't mind if your map like covers a rational many times. That's fine. You just have to make sure you cover all of them. Can somebody tell me such a map? I want a surjection from pairs of integers to the rationals. Yeah? Almost. That would not be well. Def so the suggestion was f of a comma b equals a over b. Yeah, you'd have a bit of trouble if b equals 0. So what should you do? Do you have an answer? Yeah, if b equals 0, see, once you decide to map the pair a comma b to a over b, as long as b is not 0, then you've got everything. You're already subjective. So like, the remaining case, like if, oh, here I wrote p and q. If q is 0, it doesn't matter what you could do. So just do whatever. Just output, let's say, 0. It doesn't hurt you. OK? Does that make sense? Any question? OK, so this is like a somewhat easier way if you know, you're asked to show a set is countable, just find a surjection to it from n or z squared or your favorite countable set. OK, <clears throat> let's do one last notation check. Let's say you have sets a and b, and there is a surjection from a to b. So we decided that's going to mean, or we're going to write cardinality of a is at least that of b. Presumably, that should also mean cardinality of b is less than or equal to cardinality of a, right? So again, I didn't define cardinality. I just defined the relationship between cardinalities. So we hope the following fact is true, that if there's a surjection from a to b, then there's an injection from b to a. OK, so that's true. And it's not as hard. Can somebody tell me? If I have a surjection from a to b, how can I get an injection from b to a? Yeah? 
That's all right. So I mean, you just, for example, the way it was described, you just try to take the inverse of f, OK? And since f is a surjection, you're doing well because you know, every element, you're trying to make this g, every element in b is mapped onto by at least one thing. So you don't have trouble finding something that maps to that element of b. You know, the only weird thing is like maybe several things map to that b, but that's OK. Just take one of them. OK, and it's an injection because you cannot have two, uh, let's see, why is it an injection? Uh, if you have two distinct things in the set B, they cannot uh, have the same pre-image because, I mean, they cannot have the same thing in A mapping to them because F is a function. It can only map one element of A to one thing in B. Okay, so here it is. For each B, little b in B, just define G to B to be any element of A that maps onto B. And such an A must exist because it's a surjection. F is a surjection, and I explained why it's an injection. Any questions about this? Okay, there's one small thing that I refuse to even read out loud. Uh, you probably can't even see it, which is good, because I'm embarrassed to put it up there. Anyway, you can read about it later if you want. OK, so now, uh, so far we've seen um, examples based on like number systems, like reals or rationals and integers and so forth. Let's do something that's closer at heart in spirit to computer science. So this is the notation, if you haven't seen it before, for the set of all finite length binary strings. Okay, it's written 0, 1 to the star. All the finite length binary strings. Okay, uh, the question is, is this set countable? You guys know the answer, yes or no? Do you want to say it out loud? Yeah, the answer is yes, this set is countable. Uh, can somebody tell me, well, it's not that easy, but can somebody tell me a, a listing of all the binary strings? Yeah? So we want, OK, so there's two ways if I ask you to show something that's countable, there's two ways you can kind of conceptually go about it. You can try to find a bijection from the naturals, like 0, 1, 2, 3, up to the set of all finite binary strings. Or there's this other way that's essentially the same thing, but it's just like the one we use for z squared. Like, give me like a definitive, like just a listing of all the binary strings in some order, some logical order that gets each one exactly once. Yeah? Uh, you just like count in binary. Uh, binary is close, but will you ever get the string, let's say, 0, 0, 0, 1? Not really, right? Because you would normally just notate that 1. Yeah? Like the reverse? Well, like the re uh, yeah, the re yeah, I think that would essentially work. The suggestion was to maybe count in binary, but like every time you do a string, do its reverse. The only slight annoyance with that, it's actually OK. That would give you a surjection. But um, there's a way to do it that's pretty straightforward with no duplicates. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And star n? And cross n? Oh, yeah, that's a, I mean, if people understood that, you can make a bijection or a surjection from n cross n, where, like, the first coordinate tells you the number of leading zeros to tack on, and then the second coordinate you write in binary. Okay, so actually there's a million ways to do it. Do you want to tell me your way, Anshu? Okay, there's a million ways to do it. Here's the one way you can do it as well. Here's, like, just a definitive listing of all of them. I'm just going to list all the length zero strings in binary order. That's the notation for the empty string. And all the length one strings in binary order and all the length two strings in binary order, et cetera. It's kind of similar to this one. All these proofs are sort of the same, and there are several ways to do it. But this is one I want you to remember. This is quite important. You know, this is computer science. Instead of all, like, words over the alphabet 0 and 1 is countable. OK. Now, we still haven't resolved this question that we sort of opened with a while ago. Uh, and we've just seen that like many infinite sets, like the squares, the evens, the primes, the integers, the rationals, the finite length binary strings, they're all countably infinite. They have the same cardinality as n. So you might ask, again, is this just like capturing the difference between finite and infinite? <coughs> OK, 
Okay, so this is what, again, Cantor was thinking about in 1873. And uh, the next most obvious question after you did, you know, the integers and the rationals is the reals. So let's try that. Are the reals countable? So he asked his, you know, buddy, Dedekind, also a famous mathematician, in November, what he thought. He's like, do you think the reals are countable or not? And Dedekind was like, I don't know. Like, this is a dumb question. Like, why should I care? <laughs> and Cantor was like, no. Actually, if you could prove that the reals were uncountable, you'd get a new sort of fact in number theory. Like, it would have a practical application. Like, recently, Louisville proved this theorem that there are transcendental numbers. This is not important, but a transcendental number is a number which is not the root of a polynomial with integer coefficients. And Louisville proved that there are some numbers like that. Not every real number is the root of an integer coefficient polynomial. And, you know, he was like, if you could prove this, I won't explain why, but that would give us a corollary, the corollary that um, there are transcendental numbers. So he's trying to, like, you know, say that this had some application. Anyway, he didn't, I don't know, he didn't really need that motivation. Anyway, he went ho home and tried to prove it, and he did, like, a month later. He showed that the reals are uncountable in December. <coughs> now, when he wrote the paper, though, he actually did not focus on this result. It was kind of, it was not the main feature. The main feature was he talked about proving countability of sets, like we did, like, you know, z squared, z cubed, and also this number theory application. Because... You know, back then it was kind of a crazy idea to even be discussing, like, the notion of, like, different sizes of infinite sets. And he thought that people were going to be weirded out by that or skeptical or, like, get mad at him. So he didn't focus on it too much in his paper. All right, so Galileo knows how he felt. <laughs> now, uh, his proof that the reals were uncountable then was actually very, it used heavily properties of real numbers. And then, like, 18 years later, he found a better proof. Uh, and this proof is the famous proof called the diagonal argument. Okay, so now I will tell you this better proof that the reals are uncountable using the diagonal argument. Okay. But actually, I don't want to prove that theorem quite because it's a computer science class. So I'm going to prove a slightly different theorem that's more relevant to our lives. Let's say we're going to prove that the set of all infinite binary strings is uncountable. An infinite binary string, it's like a binary string, but like it's non-terminating, okay? It has infinitely, I mean, it's like a sequence of bits, an infinite sequence of bits. So just so it's clear, like this, there's a dot, dot, dot here. Like this is an example of an infinite binary string, this is a string of all zeros. Well, this is an infinite binary string, the string where like zeros and ones alternate. Okay, this is the string of one one, then a zero, then two ones, then a zero, then three ones, then a zero, etc. That's an infinite binary string. This is a weirdo string. Uh, this is a string where the nth digit is one if and only if n is a prime. Whatever, it's just some string. Okay, so these are all infinite binary strings. Okay? And we're looking at the set of all infinite binary strings, and I want to show that that's not countable. And please remember, not too many slides ago, we showed a, a similar-looking yet very different fact. The set of all finite binary strings, 0, 1, star, is countable. Okay, so somehow there are many more infinite strings than there are finite strings. Okay, so the distinction between these two statements clear? Any questions? Okay. Great. Uh, now you might say, hey, like, didn't you tell me that like, Cantor's big theorem was that the reals were uncountable? We'll come back to that. Anyway, as I said, you know, binary strings are more interesting than real numbers. So let's start there. Okay, so here's the big theorem for the class. Uh, the set of all infinite binary strings is not countable. You have to show like a negative, that there's no bijection between the integers, let's say, or some countable set in this set. So it's going to be a proof by contradiction. Okay, so let's suppose for the sake of contradiction that this set is countable, which means that you can make a list, like a definitive list, the first infinite binary string, the second infinite binary string, the third infinite binary string, etc. So 
For example, perhaps your list looks like this. It's some list. Perhaps it looks like this. This is the zeroth, this is the first, this is the second. Remember, this is the sort of thing that we could do in the case of like the rationals. We could really say, like, here's the zeroth, here's the first, here's the second. OK, so we're going for a contradiction here to the existence of this listing. Um, OK, so it's called the diagonal argument for a reason. You consider the string formed by the diagonal in this list. <coughs> Let's see these yellow guys. OK, this is also an infinite binary string. It's sort of defined in terms of this hypothetical listing of all the infinite binary strings. Okay, so assuming this listing exists, this is like some other well-defined infinite binary string, the diagonal string. In fact, don't actually take that string. Consider the negation of that string. Okay, so just take this string but flip it. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, et cetera. Okay, the remainder of the proof, like the punchline, fits in this little space here. So we have some other infinite binary string. And uh, what will the contradiction be? What will I, don't tell me the final answer, but what will I contradict? Uh huh. Yeah, you'll contradict the statement that this is a listing of all of the infinite binary strings. So uh, I'm just telling you, this string that we made up cannot be anywhere on the list because, like, visibly, it's different from every string on the list. For every string on the list, like the seventh string on the list differs from this string in the seventh position, so they're not the same. And the ninth string in this list differs from this string on the ninth position, so they're not the same. <coughs> okay, so that's the end of the proof. Uh, does it make sense? Is there any question? Since this proof is important, let me just write the proof exactly again, but using different words. I'll take out all those words and put in new words. Uh, suppose for contradiction's sake that the set of infinite binary strings is countable. So that means there's a surjection from the naturals to this set of infinite binary strings. That's really what it means to say there's a listing that includes every one. So call that surjection f. Now define a new infinite binary string w by setting the nth bit of w to be the negation of the nth bit of f of n. So it's like take the nth string in the list take its nth digit, that's like a diagonal entry, and negate it. And now, to finish the proof, we're going to claim that that string is not, uh, you know, that f is not a surjection because there's no m such that f of m equals w. And sort of by definition, you know, for, any, for this w, it cannot be f of m because w and f of m, which is a string, disagree in the mth position. OK. Great. So this is actually pretty awesome. We, at first, it was looking at just like every infinite set was going to be countable. But somehow, we found an even bigger set, the set of all infinite binary strings. It's not countable. <coughs> Great. So uh, that's what I just said. Now, you might, uh, let's come back to R, which is like a more famous example, the set of reals. Um, turns out that R is also uncountable. It's also much bigger than the set of naturals. In fact, even a subset of it, the set of all real numbers between 0 and 1, that's, if you remember math, this is the notation for this. The set of all real numbers between 0 and 1 is written bracket 0, comma 1, bracket. So even that, which is a subset of the reals, is uncountable. So how do you prove that? Well, uh, I'm going to show you in that there's a bijection between the infinite binary strings and the set of real numbers between 0 and 1. So these two sets have the same cardinality. It's pretty easy to see, actually, there's a surjection from, you know, r is bigger than the set of reals between 0 and 1. There's a surjection from here to here. So r is even bigger than that. But we just showed that the set of binary strings has cardinality strictly bigger than the naturals. It's uncountable. OK, so to show the reals are uncountable, I, I'm just going to show that there's a bijection between the reals between 0 and 1 and the infinite binary strings. Is it OK? <clears throat> OK, so what is it? What's this bijection between the numbers between 0 and 1 and the infinite binary strings? It's just a function f, which takes any real number and maps it to its binary expansion. This is something like you had to know about in homework 5, problem 5. You know, you're used to representing integers in binary, but you can also represent real numbers in binary, right? As Every number between 0 and 1 has a binary expansion. Like this is a half. You know, this is a half 
column, the quarters column, the sixteenths column. And you know, every number like one third can be written as an infinite binary string. And uh, you know, every number between zero and one has a binary expansion, and every binary expansion, which is like an infinite string, corresponds to a real number between zero and one. So we have a bijection. OK, math nerds, or do we? Is there a problem with what I just said? Yes? Yes, yes. There's a super annoying problem with this. This looks great. It's like so nice. It's very clean. We did it. There's like a super annoying problem with it. Technically, it's not a surjection because uh, you never get this infinite binary string, zero followed by all ones. Because zero followed by all ones is the same as a half. This is a minor point, so don't get too stressed about it. But in the same way that like in normal base 10, like 0.4999999 is the same as a half, 0 0.5000, like that's the same number. Same in binary, like this is the same number as 0.1000000. So technically, half has two different binary expansions, which is annoying, right? So like, you know, I actually asked you, but in some sense, I would hope that you didn't notice this, because uh, everything was very nice in the previous slide, and like, this is like a fly in the ointment. But this kind of stuff happens in math. Like, okay, sometimes there's a fly in the ointment, but it's not like a real problem. So like, this almost works, and there's like, there's like a variety of dopey ways you can get around this. Like any number of hacks can like get rid of uh, get around this fact. You can like make an actual surjection from the integers between sorry the reals between zero and one into the infinite binary string. Uh, if you're bored for the rest of the lecture, you can try to think of one. But otherwise, uh, I'll just have the TAs do one or two in the recitation. OK, actually, that's more or less the last thing I wanted to say about the reals being uncountable. Um, I'd rather you remember that the set of infinite binary strings is uncountable. But anyway, any questions about that? OK, so this is a bit of a summary of what we've seen so far. Um, you actually can define for a given set what its cardinality is. OK, and the mathematicians give it names. I'll tell you the names just for fun. But I, I more want to just sort of tell you the taxonomy of set sizes. So we have sets of size 0, like the empty set. We have sets of size 1, like these sets. We have sets of size 2, like these sets, etc. Uh, then we have all these sets, the naturals, the primes, squares, rationals, etc. And they all have the same size. And the mathematicians call it aleph 0. That's what they call it. Uh, but it's just the countably infinite, the sets of countably infinite size. Uh, we have another one, though. We just saw that these sets, like the set of infinite binary strings or the reals, they're bigger. They're not countable. Um, actually, these, I just told you that the reals are at least as big as the interval from 0 to 1, but they're actually the same. Uh, these sets are, their, their size is called C, the continuum. Uh, again, not important, but these are the names. <coughs> So that's a bunch of different sizes. And you could sort of ask, hey, are there like more sizes? Uh, so you could ask, OK, is it possible to squeeze in any sizes here that are bigger than finite but less than the size of the naturals? And the answer is no. Uh, you could think about why that is. Basically, if you have a set and it's bigger than any finite size, and you can say, well, take one element from it, then take another element from it, then take another element from it. And since it's not finite, like, you can keep going. So you get like an infinite sequence. So that proves it's sort of at least as many as the naturals. Anyway, so you can just take my word for it that that's a fact. There's nothing hiding between finite and countably infinite. Uh, this is a more interesting question, though. Is there any set whose size is between that of the naturals and that of the reals? We just know the reals are bigger than naturals. We, maybe there are some other sets that are in between. So this is another thing that Cantor thought about. And it kind of drove him a bit um, uh, annoyed. He called this the continuum hypothesis. He believed that the answer was no, that you know, the next biggest size after naturals is the real size of the reals. 
And he spent a really long time trying to prove it, and he failed to prove it. And actually, there's a very good reason why he failed to prove it, uh, and it's not because what he was trying to prove was false. Nevertheless, there was a good reason why he could not prove it. Uh, this was given by this guy, Paul Cohen. We'll mention him in like two weeks. So later we'll see this good reason why he couldn't prove it, even though it's not false. Okay. Good. Um, great. So we have 20 minutes left. Any questions at this point? No? Okay. Now we come to an interesting part in the course. You see, the last bunch of lectures were about like linear algebra and group theory and number theory and so forth. And this is the title of the course. Uh, so this is actually the point where I believe from now on all the lectures will be more or less about computer science, and not just. <laughs> He's not even in the class. Anyway, um, so that's good. You know, of course, you need to know like a lot of awesome math, and some of these ideas are like proto-computer science. But I think uh, more or less we're going to talk mainly about computation for the rest of the course. Okay, cool. So let me tell you a little bit about how computation connects to countability. So I want to revisit a question that we, you know, one of the very early questions that I paused on, the, uh, whether or not the primes are countable. And I'm going to talk about how to prove sets are countable using the power of computation. So yeah, you might remember it's a little bit, if you haven't thought about it before, it's a little bit stressful to say, like, what is the bijection between the naturals and the primes? It's the function f of n is the nth prime. It's not such a neat little formula to define a function. And we just said, hey, it's OK. This is a well-defined function. f maps n to the nth prime. You might exactly, what exactly does this well-defined mean? Well, I don't actually really want to say, but here's uh, one particular kind of well-defined rule, I will emphasize several times that like, there are functions that are well-defined that you cannot show are well-defined in this way. But here's a very common way to like, show or convince yourself that a function is well-defined. It's just anything that you could compute by a computer program, let's say in your favorite programming language. We're going to make this even clearer in su succeeding lectures, but it means what you think it means. If you take this point of view, then this is a lot more satisfying, right? So, I mean, this function that maps n to the nth prime, you're like, yes, I could write a computer program that took as input n and output the nth prime. OK, and that sort of gives legitimacy to the notion that this is like a well-defined mapping from naturals to primes. OK, so this is what I just said. Uh, you can sort of convince yourself this is well-defined because you can write a computer program that would compute f. Similar for you know, this other seemingly somewhat questionable looking one, the, the one that we used for q, where f of n was the nth rational in our listing of q. Remember, first we listed z squared by this spiral, which even that, like, you'd have to imagine writing a program for, and then you went through them one by one, and you omitted the ones you'd seen before. It's well defined in particular because you can write a computer program that would output that list of rationals one by one. OK, let me say uh, some caveats about this. One of them is already mentioned, but it's very important, so I'll mention it again. Um, first, and we're, we're going to talk about this in future lectures, but I haven't probably defined even what it means to compute something with a computer program, but we're going to do this, like really formally, later in the course. But for now, your intuition is correct. Like, you know what I mean, and what you think I mean is what is correct. And two, again, there are, this is not the only way something can be well-defined. So you can have a well-defined function, as we'll see, which cannot actually be computed by a computer program. That's like a little spoiler alert for a future lecture. Do you know who this person is? Oh, it's the most famous, yeah, Alan Turing, most famous computer scientist of all. Okay, 
So now I want to tell you something that may help you on your homework in this class and other class. And actually, whenever I tell, you know, when I've told this before, like, I hesitate to tell it to you because it's like the secret for solving so many homework problems. It's like, because, you know, when you learn about this stuff, then you get the homework and it's like, prove this set is countable, prove that set is countable, and like, here's like the nuclear bomb that you can just use to like automatically solve these problems, more or less. It's the computer scientist method. So look. Here's one thing that we showed. We showed that the set of all finite binary strings is countable. Okay, all the finite binary strings is countable. If you think about that for two seconds, here we looked at all strings where the symbols were either 0 or 1. But if I was like, what about all the strings where the symbols are 0, 1, or 2, the same proof would still work. That is also uh, countable. You know, because you can list them, again, you could list all the strings of length 0, 1, 2, 3, and like within each size, you could list the strings in lexicographic order. Okay, so in fact, if, any, if sigma is any finite alphabet or a set of symbol names, sigma star means all the finite strings where each symbol is from that alphabet. Okay, and it's not hard to show. It's the same proof that this is a countable set. Okay, any, any uh, comment about that? Okay, good. So for example, here is a very nice finite set, the set of the following symbols, the digits and the letters from A to Z, and these symbols, plus, minus, star, slash, and caret. That's a finite set. So the set of all finite strings made up of these symbols is countable. And you know, you could list it. First I'll list all the length zero strings, then all the length one strings, then all the length two strings, then all the length three strings, etc. <coughs> okay, what is this good for? Well, suppose somebody asks you, like, show this set S is countable. Okay? So you pick your favorite alphabet, sigma, and you know that it's countably infinite. That's a theorem that, from this lecture. So it suffices to find a surjection from this set of all strings in this alphabet to your set, S, that you're trying to show is countable. Right? That implies that the cardinality of sigma star is at least that of S. This is the same as N, so it shows that S is countable. And this is it. This is the tool. This is like a, an excellent technique for showing any old set S is countable. Because really what it's just saying is you have to find a way to describe each element in S uniquely by like a finite string of symbols, which is a pretty powerful paradigm. Okay, so you just need, it just has to be a surjection too. So it's okay if you, you know, define each uh, element of S more than once. You just have to make sure it has at least one way of defining it. So for example, here's a, a sample problem. Do you remember this notation Q bracket X? It meant the set of all polynomials, the variable is named X, and the coefficients can be any rational. That's a lot of objects. The set of all polynomials, they can have any degree, and like the coefficients can be any rational number. But it's countable. How do you show that? Here's a valid solution. Look, you just say, look, any polynomial over a symbol's x with rational coefficients, you can write it down like this. Like, this is x cubed minus a quarter x squared plus 6x minus 22 over 7. Right? This is a finite string using symbols from this alphabet. So that's it. You're done. Right? I mean, you have to just say that, look, <laughs> it's no joke. Right? Every element in this set you can write as a finite string using these symbols. So therefore, the set is countable. Any questions? Okay, so why can't you show that the set of all the infinite binary strings is countable by this method? After all, it just uses two symbols. Yes? Yeah, it has to be finite strings. I mean, that was uh, a simple question. Great, so this method can be used to prove a lot of stuff is countable. Okay, I'm just going to end with like uh, some interesting factoids. <clears throat> the real number one seventh is what you might call computable. What do I mean by that? You could write a program. When I say a program here, I mean one that runs forever, but it has a property that it just prints out the digits of one seventh. There are infinitely many of them, but like it would be a very simple program. It would be like for i equals one to infinity, or just while true, print one four two 
eight, five, seven, and then just do that over and over again. Okay, that's a program that prints out one seventh. Actually, the same is true for a lot of numbers you know, like square root two. It's not such a simple program, but like, you could write a program that computes like as many digits as you want of root two, right? I mean, you can like do this binary search thing, like binary search between one and two to find the first few digits and like go further and further to get the next few digits and just print out the digits, right? You can ask a computer, like, tell me root two to like a million digits and there's an algorithm that will do it. Yeah? Uh, halting means that the program stops. So actually, all the programs I'm talking about here, it's a bit odd, but I'm going to assume that they never stop. They run forever. Because, you know, most real numbers have expressions that have infinite number of digits. In fact, even the rational numbers, you can just, you know, to print out a half, you can just do like print point, uh, 0.5, and then while true, print 0. Okay, and that would print out like the binary, or sorry, the decimal representation of a half. Uh, no, that would be computable. I mean, let, okay, I didn't define it super formally. You can either, let's say, have the thing print out 1.0000000. Let's just say that. Okay, so just assume that, you know, even if it's like 3, you just print out 3.0000000. And, you know, it, it takes some thought, but you can write a program that computes like pi or root 2 or the first prime larger than this. Okay, these are all numbers that you can compute. Any, any more questions about that? Okay. Now, let's say you're writing them in some language, like um, whatever. Your favorite language. Uh, what is your favorite language? Python. Yeah. <laughs> Python is pretty simple, so let's say Python. Okay. So, okay, let's solve the Python programs. You could write all, all of the, you could compute all these numbers in Python. And what is the set of all Python programs? It's just, in some sense, the set of all strings over like the 255 or whatever characters, right, that you can type a Python program in. Most of them would not like even run because it would be a syntax error, but at least every valid Python program is a finite string of symbols between like whatever, 0 and 255. Okay, but we just saw this set is countable. So the set of all Python programs is countable. And each Python program can only print out like one real number in, in the lucky case that it indeed runs. So the set of all computable real numbers is countable. The set of all numbers that you could ever print out or dream up is countable. But R is uncountable. The set of all real numbers is uncountable. So there's like many more real numbers than the set of numbers you could imagine ever printing out. So there exist uncomputable reals. That's the conclusion. There's like a real number which cannot be it exists, but it cannot be printed out by any computer program. Okay, that's it. So, um, see you on Tuesday. There will be a real genuine quiz on Tuesday <laughs> with questions. <laughs>